All right, uh, this is Cut and Splice. Um, this is Jason with Matt and Gil. We all uh, went to film school together, and uh, we used to live together, and we watched way too many movies together. And now we talk about movies. And that's what this is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all, right. all right. All right. We're talking about uh, 1986's Manhunter, and uh, as well as uh, the 2002's Red Dragon. Uh, both of these movies are an uh, adaptation of the book Red Dragon, which I believe I wrote down Thomas Harris. I believe that's the guy's name. Um, oh, that is that. Yes, uh, thank you. And um, the that is the first book uh, that comes before uh, Silence of the Lambs or The Silence of the Lambs. Um, and uh, yeah, they're uh, and so they are both adaptations of the same book, and we're going to discuss them at length. And then, of course, as always, we'll uh, uh, mostly do uh, reviewing and recommending, and then. The second part will get into spoilers um, and comparing and contrasting and comparing and contrasting for sure in this case yes uh and we'll try to do a better job than the first time around <laughs> 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 at least fo focusing on comparing and not just getting stuck on uh on flaws in each movie separately <laughs> but i guess they had that in common did either of you guys see red dragon in theaters yes because i did i was quite excited to see it I think I might have seen it. I think it was back then when I was watching more movies in theaters and 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 it had decent reviews, especially for a Brett Ratner movie. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh pre Netflix and pre uh COVID and stuff. And, or kids. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I know Gil and I had the privilege of going to the one of the screenings, uh the um American Cinematheque uh, screenings at the Egyptian Theater to see Manhunter. I had previously seen it once before that at home. Gil, had you? Was that the first time you had ever seen it, or had you seen it before that? Yeah, I think I, I think it was the first time I saw it. Wasn't that screening? Okay. Yeah, I, I think the first time that I saw Manhunter, it was actually on a VHS tape. Uh, uh, so hmm. fuck, I feel old. But yeah, it it, it 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 was a while ago, and uh, actually, I hadn't seen it in um, I think more than a decade before I rewatched it for this episode. So uh, it it was kind of fun revisiting it. Hmm. Um, I was just gonna say, regardless of whatever else we talk about, before getting into any details at all, I just want to say that I find it very interesting. I did, this might have actually been one of the reasons why I brought it up as a, a thing I wanted to talk about with you guys, because I felt this way beforehand, and now after rewatching both of them, I definitely still feel the same way about it. Manhunter has a, what I feel is an odd kind of cult following, uh, you know, to it. There's a lot of people who really love that movie in a weird sort of way, and uh, I really like it. I, I really like Manhunter. Um, I think it's a very special movie, but for all of its praise and everything that I, I feel about it, at the end of the day, I do actually like Red Dragon more. And that's just kind of the basis of how my feelings are for these things. I, I mean, I, I don't know if you want me to go full in to my assessment, but I, I am finding myself much more deeply conflicted after rewatching these movies and actually for the first time watching them back to back in the same night in my overall uh, assessments, because like, first of all, like this is not okay. Manhunter is not Michael Mann at his worst. I mean, no. Michael Mann, at, uh, Michael Mann at his worst is like public enemy. I, I mean, he's made worse movies than Manhunter. Uh, Manhunter is Michael Mann at, mediocre level and red dragon is brett ratner at his best no complaints I, for me on that one and i honestly think that these movies are basically equals in in terms of my in terms of my assessment of them 
the thing is, everything that Manhunter got right, at least in my mind, and you guys can challenge me on this as we go on, everything that Manhunter got right, Red Dragon got wrong, and everything that Red Dragon got right, Manhunter got wrong. Interesting. And a large part of that is the casting, to me. And, and how they actually dealt with the performances. You know, the three leads in Will Graham, Francis Dollarhide, and Hannibal Lecter are really everything that both movies are focused on, obviously. Will Graham in Manhunter is played by William Peterson. In Manhunter, he's played by Edward Norton. Edward Norton is obviously more of a household name than William Peterson. I mean, you know, unless you're a a, a CSI fan or or something. <laughs> uh, Matt, just for uh, real correction, well, I think you said now, I think yeah, you said the, the 80s. had had um, Ed Norton. You meant Red Dragon, I believe. Right, Red Dragon. Uh, right, Ed Norton played Will Graham in Red Dragon. William Peterson played the same role in Manhunter. Obviously, Hannibal Lecter was played by Anthony Hopkins in Red Dragon. In Manhunter, it was Brian Cox. And in Manhunter, Tom Noonan played Dollar Hyde. And in Red Dragon, he was played by Ray Fiennes. When you look at the cast of Red Dragon, just in those three roles... Like, you've got three really damn good actors who are basically household names. Uh, I mean, these are brilliant actors. But the thing is, they don't work together as a unit in the same way that the cast worked in Manhunter. I mean, it, like, in fact, they are so disparate that they needed to actually insert lines in Red Dragon, like, you're not, we're not so different, you and I. You know, that lines in Manhunter too, though. Yeah, but you didn't need it in Manhunter. <laughs> you didn't need well, it because um, you... Then there's no question that Manhunter is the more visual film, for sure. Right, but but my point is that Dollarhide, Lecter, and Graham all in Manhunter, the way the casting worked... And the way that they all played off of one another in one way or another, you just kind of got it that these are all kind of the same dude with minor differences. Whereas in Red Dragon, Anthony Hopkins is Hannibal Lecter. Like, he, he just is Hannibal Lecter. Anybody who plays Hannibal Lecter from here on out is going to be intimidating, uh, not intimidating, sorry, imitating Anthony Hopkins. I, I, I mean, Brian Cox can't live up to that. And obviously he couldn't live up to it, you know, like five years before Silence of the Lambs came out. Still a good performance, I, though. Uh, I like it. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's, it's still a good performance. I, I'm not dissing brian cox at all it's just that anthony hopkins is hannibal lecter but i i I didn't like how you know edward norton was basically playing will graham like a like a boy scout and (laughs) yeah that's true (laughs) i don't like how you know they cast ray fines in the role of dollar hide I, I mean, again, I love Ray Fiennes. I think Ray Fiennes is one of the better actors that we have in the world today. <laughs> but you cast him in that role, and then you've got uh, uh, Emily Watson, right? Uh, yes, Emily uh, Watson. Uh, uh, playing Reba. Uh, and you've got her like describing how people are talking about him at work, and you you have to have her talking to Ray Fiennes and like, well, they say that you've got a great body and that you're self-conscious about your face, but you shouldn't be because you're super hot. And, (laughs) and that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem like 
a recipe for a psychopathic killer. Whereas Tom Noonan isn't Ray Fiennes in terms of like being a good looking dude. He, he, he Tom Noonan in Manhunter, I buy that guy as being somebody who is so disgusted at himself that he starts torturing people and murdering people. But anyway, I, I I've talked. Yeah, well I, I think there's an explanation for that, but I think I should leave it for the spoiler part. All right. Um, because I think it goes into the different approaches as far as theme and storytelling that both movies went for. But I do agree that um, it's a very good assessment about them being exactly equal, almost like they get different things right and wrong, that they equalize each other. It's it, You can make a masterpiece if you combine the two, basically. It could be like as yeah. good as Silence of the Lamb. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the funny thing on IMDb, they're both 7.2, exactly. Ah. <laughs> and uh, and I, I did, uh, as far as rating goes, I guess we can get to that too. Uh, I rated them both 7, so um, without even knowing. So... So it's um, not without, without without knowing before this episode. Like I, I rated Red Dragon back in the 2000s, and I rated Manhunter probably when we saw it at the, the screening with uh, with Maynard from Tool. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it all makes perfect sense. Um, it it is interesting. The approaches are very different. I, I feel like um, Michael Mann here pulls a bit of a Spielberg in Duel. I just saw there was an article about uh, Duel. Uh, 50 years or something since the Spielberg's first movie. And it feels like he he just put everything into this movie. Like he was mm-hmm. like, I'm going to make this Citizen Kane. I'm going to like just every scene's going to be explosively visual and overly dramatic. And it's just so over the top. But it sort of worked for an 80s movie. It, it wouldn't work in the... Uh, in the sequel, uh, in the in the remake, uh, unless uh, Red Dragon, uh, unless you really establish that style, almost like a Sergio Leone type of stuff he was doing there, a bit like, so over the top, but but yeah, but uh, it was interesting. And then Red Dragon is funny enough. Uh, William Peterson, it's like CSI. <laughs> it feels like a procedural, like it's, it's it's not very cinematic. It's just him going through houses and doing his investigation not a lot of visual storytelling going on there so it's uh it's a very there's a few good scenes with a lector that go a bit visually interesting but very few so it's um it's funny it's uh it's interesting uh, but then the red dragon did some subtle things story-wise that were i felt more sophisticated than manhunter so agreed uh, yeah so so go figure and we can get into them in the second half but but it, it is interesting how there's uh, there you couldn't find two such different movies made about the same story, but they're also of the exact same quality. <laughs> like that's such a weird combination. Uh, but but that's that's what's on our hands. I feel like. Yeah, uh, it, and I mean, it is also interesting. At, at least for me, it was interesting just looking at Dante Spinotti in 1986 versus Dante Spinotti in 2002 shooting the exact same movie. <laughs> if you, uh, seen, you bring him up, um, one of the few things I remember about the q and I, I don't even know if you'd call it a Q&A because it's not like he made the movie or anything, but when Gil and I went to go see it, as, as he mentioned briefly, uh, it was one of those things where they pick a celebrity and they let them pick the movie kind of thing. And so uh, Maynard, I guess, uh, chose this movie and they had him up there answering some questions and more more not really answering questions more like talking about why he loved the movie and why he chose it and stuff but before they said anything they just said that somebody in their office at the cinematech or whatever said like uh you know they wanted to contact some of the filmmakers and just see if they could get a uh, a word or something about it or whatever and i guess the the, the message they got back from uh Dante Spinotti, I guess, or uh, so they just he just said like something to the effect of uh, every single shot that that they set up in Manhunter was done with extreme purpose, I guess is the, the way he put it, something of that nature. Like I, I don't remember exactly his wording, but he just <laughs> wanted to emphasize that to everybody. But that I guess him and Michael Mann spent 
a lot of time trying to figure out exactly how they wanted to do it. So I, I think that plays well into what Gil was saying about how it's this, this like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to even describe that movie, but it's, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's some stuff there. Like they shoot him through the, uh, the sun's going down on the, like the low, like the lo locales too. Like the, if you compare between them, it's so romanticized in Manhunter yes. where they live initially. The sun goes down and the shiny and the lens flare and, and all these yeah. very elaborate moving shots. It's, it's just him and his family relaxing. <laughs> it's like setting up, but it's so romanticized that it, 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 there's an impact to the story later on because this is the life that he set up. And then Edward Norton's life in Red Dragon is like, meh. You know, he lives on a, like, I don't know. a lake with a boat. I, like, it still looks nice, I, but it's, I, I it's just not as romanticized visually. Yeah, well, okay, so visually in the camera, maybe. But they, yeah, they go so out of their way to show that he's living in like a, what would essentially be like a tropical paradise kind of thing. They have some nice wardrobe choice things. Like, he when he's at home... He's always wearing sandals and shorts, which is like implying that he's very relaxed. He's got a very relaxed life. His wife is always wearing very uh, like revealing clothing, not in like a slutty way, but in a like a we live on the beach sort of way. I mean, you know, they, they definitely thought about it. They, they put some choices in there. Oh, yeah. No, no, it's mostly just not as romanticized as yeah. I, I feel like in Manhunter. It's well, just really that shot of also him in the bed discussing whether or not he's going to leave. is like, I, I was, I remember watching that this time. Just oh, like, yeah. That's oh like crazy. <laughs> that, that, that day for night thing, right? The, yeah. It's all bluish. It is kind yeah, of day for night. Yeah. <laughs> it is because they're getting the moonlight as if it's the moonlight on the, on the <laughs> ocean, but it's obviously the sun. But yeah. it looks crazy, and I was like, so and, and it's so sexy too. Like it's such an yeah, 80s it is. thing. It is. But uh, yeah, you mentioned yeah. the visuals and the the really obvious choices and stuff. I don't know precisely what Michael Mann was thinking, but I definitely feel like there's some sort of visual theme that he wanted throughout the whole movie because he keeps intentionally finding ways to. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know if this is right or not. My interpretation of it was to put people in cages visually. He keeps yeah. filling people through grates and through windows and through things. Even There's even a moment where um, in Manhunter, um, Jack Crawford is played by mm -hmm. uh, Dennis Farina, the late, great Dennis Farina. There's like, he's got this really odd paperweight on his desk that's like a, a sphere of glass in a box or something. And they intentionally move the camera just at the end of the scene, just to like put him in the circle. <laughs> it's like, it's really interesting, but, <laughs> and odd at the same time. Yeah. This is in Manhunter, right? Yeah. In Manhunter. Yeah. I'm talking about Michael Mann's one. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. I mean, there's the shot of him running down the stairs, like after he sees Lecter. Okay, I just got to say, real quick, real quick. Okay, I, 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 I could get into, I have a, a whole list of things I wanted to talk about comparing them, but I have to talk about that scene now that you brought it up. I think it's really cool that they have Will Graham react the way he does. But if there is one scene that is so over the top and so just taken to the point where it's bad in Manhunter, it's that scene because <laughs> the back and the forth. And I'm like, where the hell did you film this? This is clearly like, I mean, it's in LA. Anyone who's like been to the LA convention center sees it and goes, Oh, this is used in like 18 different, you know, futuristic movies that have been made throughout the, the decades and <laughs> whatever. I don't know. It's not, it's not the LA convention center, but it looks like it. It's ridiculous. There's just, it, there's, and why? Why is he not in the elevator? Why did he not? It's like seven or eight floors of a zigzagging back and forth. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's, uh, it's hilarious. And there's some other and stuff yet, too. And yet, I actually yeah. think that if Red Dragon, I, I, I mean, don't do any of that, obviously, but if they had at least had him walk out, and just react a little bit more. Like, even that one was missing something. Like, I don't want the William Peterson reaction, 
but give me something. You know, he just kind of gets on the phone with his family or with Jack Crawford or something. And Jack's like, are you all right? Yeah, he's all yeah, relaxed. You know? He's way and, and too I mean, uh, with that. Yeah. It. yeah. It, it just, I don't know. <laughs> Neither of them are perfect, but <laughs> that scene no, to they're, me they're, is, they're completely is definitely different where it goes over characters. the top. No, the, their characters, yeah. uh, the biggest difference between the two movies is the lead character. It's, yes. Uh, there's no yeah. doubt that the way they approach that is just completely different. And it will be interesting. We should get into it in the second half. Maybe we'll discover something yeah. as we talk about it yeah. of why yeah. that is. Or maybe we have theories. Yeah. Well, before we go there, I'll just finish, I'll follow up with what you said. For me, I can't even think about how I would rate these movies without comparing it to Silence of the Lambs. Because, I mean, I saw that first. And I, I think I saw Silence of the Lambs first when I was pretty young. Uh, you know, relatively speaking, of course, I saw part of Manhunter on TV. I watched about maybe 45 minutes to an hour of it, but I didn't finish it because there was something happening. And I had to leave or something like that. Um, I also just didn't think it was as good as Silence of the Lambs. And then when I heard that Red Dragon was coming out, I was really excited about that. I saw that and maybe Hannibal or something like that uh, in that order. But um, it was a year before a dragon. So, uh, right, right. Well, but I don't, but I did, I can tell you for sure I didn't see Hannibal in theaters. So I, I probably saw Hannibal on a DVD probably very soon before Red Dragon or just after. It doesn't really matter. That's not yeah. important. My point was just simply to say that I consider Silence of the Lambs to be like a, a 9.5. I think it's like a phenomenal, phenomenal movie. I would say Red Dragon is probably an eight and then Manhunter probably a solid seven and then Hannibal's like a six. Okay. Oh, so Red Dragon's more for you. Just a bit, yeah. Or noticeably, but uh, not, you know, not a lot. Oh, I, I was about to uh, interject and say that we might be pushing on spoilers already so we should probably go into the second half yeah, so uh let's do that my might, might as well uh might as well do the ratings and uh, I, I i mean honestly it's funny like gil was talking about them uh, both manhunter and red dragon being 7.2s on imdb i think they're both 7.5s for me uh, i i think they cancel each other out i think that the the strengths of manhunter are there and red dragon missed a lot of opportunities. And I think that there are strengths to red dragon that were there that Manhunter missed. And they just kind of even out for me. <laughs> I mean, I, I think yeah. they're both 7.5s for me. So. Uh, yeah. Well. And, uh, and interestingly, um, the people who did see them differently, the critics, uh, it seems like, uh, they, um, they rated, um, six for um like 60 meta score and then 75 like 7.5 for um manhunter so red dragon is rated lower but but yes and and this could be based on what i saw some of the arguments they're making is that manhunter is really borderline an art house movie <laughs> about a yeah. procedural uh, it, it really takes it to uh, a, a high level of uh, cinematic experience and uh, it's similar, I guess, to what David Fincher maybe does in Zodiac and where the visuals are so strong that they, regardless of what the actual specifics, uh, it elevates the movie. And maybe critics just react more to that highbrow type of stuff than, than Red Dragon just being a solid procedural yeah. with very good cast. That's about it. So what are your ratings? Oh, I, I, I threw it. I said seven and seven. I, I said it a bit earlier, but yeah, I jumped again. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Just, just wanted to. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, this is something where I, I, I actually think this is relevant. You know, we should actually give Michael Mann a little bit more credit, though, because like he didn't have that built in like baseline like you know I, I mean Jonathan Demi made the decision to cast Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter so Brett Ratner didn't have to make that decision Brett Ratner could basically I, I, and basically did remake 
Manhunter shot for shot in a lot of ways up until the end. And, you know, by the way, we, we, we can talk about this too. Yes. Red dragon, especially when it comes to the ending is more faithful to the book than Manhunter was, but Brett Ratner didn't have to make any decisions. I think Matt, if you're, I think we would all agree that even if you were to just show these two movies to, to somebody and they didn't know anything else. I mean, I, I think that, most people would agree that Michael Mann is a far, far better director than Brett Ratner. But as you said in the beginning, this is a pretty mediocre show of Michael Mann's talents. Whereas I I think we're all in agreement that this is Brett Ratner's greatest work that he's ever done. And essentially what he was paid to do in this movie, because I mean, let's face it, he's basically a traffic cop you know, uh, as a traffic cop of a director. What he was paid to do was to, you know, make a prequel that would look and feel as much like Silence of the Lambs as possible. And I mean, you know, considering what the what Manhunter looked like, I guess it, it, that also goes a long ways of showing how um, talented uh, Spinotti is, as you know, because he just like basically made the movie look a lot like the way the the other two movies look as well yeah uh, i was gonna throw something before i forget silence of the lambs i i rated it an eight <laughs> so i've never been a huge fan of that movie but it's still higher Last than minute. these two for sure <laughs> yeah i know well, it's kind of long and boring i mean the stuff with lecter is really good but it's only those few scenes the rest of the movie is i jody foster is only good when she's with lecter i feel like other than that she's not as captivating <laughs> and that uh um I, I, yeah but I, but, but that's uh, that's for a different episode <laughs> but but you know just um it is funny I, i've always found weird how that movie it's on top i, I know the performance is like an, an all times best like it, it's it's like brando and uh, you know, and, and like godfather or apocalypse now obviously it's that type of caliber performance but that's pretty much it. That's uh, I, I, that the movie I, itself is not spectacular. It's I, okay. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to to verify this, but I, I think that Anthony Hopkins was nominated for Best Actor, and he only had like 15 minutes of screen time. You're talking about for for Silence of the Lambs? Yeah. It won. Yeah, for Best Picture. Uh, best actor for Anthony Hopkins, best actress for Jodie Foster, uh, best director for Jonathan Demi. It kind of swept, and uh, best adapted screenplay for Ted Talley. Yeah, but uh, it, who, but, by the I way, mean, wrote the screenplay for Red Dragon? Yeah, but oh, but, I mean, that's the, a good the, the, but yeah, I mean the point being that you know Anthony Hopkins was barely on the screen. Yes, in of terms course. of actual time. Uh, well, yeah, but, I mean, that's yeah. that's why I said Brando and Apocalypse now, because Brando is on the screen ah. for five minutes and it's very memorable. <laughs> yes. Good comparison. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Great comparison. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's interesting. Brett Ratner was a f weird choice for it. Uh, and very Jason weird. kept saying whenever I kept uh, I saying to Jason that Red Dragon is his best movie, he's like, well, Rush Hour is pretty good. <laughs> it is. Rush Hour is, is good. And, and Money Talks is fun. <laughs> But um, <laughs> no, no, they're not bad. Yes, they are. And by far the way, from Red Dragon. I'll say one last thing about rating directors and stuff. I, I don't mind as much as most people X3. Like, I, 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 oh, I actually oh, don't oh. think it's that bad of a movie. That's because you don't read comic books. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it's those kind of movies. And, and that's what Brett Radner pulls off. Like you said, he's a traffic cop. Like, he, he can just emulate at a low level, and it's just good enough for those specific movies. It kind of works. It's not spectacular, but it's comfort food. It, it just works. It's it's a movie experience. It's generic, <laughs> you know. I, I don't know, but it's it's safe more than anything. But we, we should definitely <laughs> get to the second. Unless is there anything else before we get to the spoilers? <laughs> uh, uh, I I thought we were already. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. Oh, we should always spoil. say the word spoilers multiple times to yeah. scream it. Because uh, unless I'm going to cut the episodes and. Okay, uh, okay, uh, okay, spoilers are <laughs> going to abound uh, at this point. <laughs> One thing that is interesting is, you know, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, 
that the ending of Red Dragon, uh, surprise, surprise, is actually more faithful to the actual Thomas Harris book, Red Dragon, than Manhunter was. Well, I, that I, whole, I don't know where you're going, but just to throw it out there, not just the ending, other stuff too. But oh, yeah, I, I, yeah, it, well, yeah, especially the end. You know, uh, yeah. in the book, Dollar Hyde does fake his death in the home that he burns down, and then he shows up at Will Graham's house later on. And I, I mean, again, there, there, there are still differences. Like in the book, Dollar Hyde stabs Will Graham in the face and permanently scars him before Will Graham's wife, Molly, comes in and shoots Dollar Hyde to death. The ending of Red Dragon isn't as brutal as the ending of the book, but obviously Manhunter ends with Will Graham busting through Dollar Hyde's window and killing Dollar Hyde before he's able to uh, mutilate uh, 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 shit, what's her face? Uh, Reba. Uh, right. Uh, and, you know, the movie ends in Dollar Heights house in Manhunter, whereas Red Dragon actually follows the book all the way back to Will Graham's house and Molly killing Dollar Hyde at the end. I, I, honestly, I'm a little conflicted about which was the better approach, but uh, I'll, I'll throw that out to you guys. I think the biggest difference plays with the two movies plays into what you just said and also what you said before about how a lot of it's about the main character and how their approach to it. I think yeah. the biggest difference is, I mean, look at the names of the movies, right? They changed the name for Manhunter to Manhunter from Red Dragon. Manhunter, yeah. Michael Mann's film, Manhunter, came out before Silence of the Lambs and yep. is a adaptation of the book where they alter the story in subtle and not so subtle ways. And they focus and wrap the entire story around Will Graham. It's really all about him. Everything yep. with Dollar Hyde is less. You get less screen time, less scenes, less story, less everything. Everything with Lecter is less, less scenes, less story, less everything. It's all about Graham. And that's why it makes sense to, at the end to end it the way they did. That's why the scenes with Lecter are shorter and faster paced. They're just kind of getting through them. They're not they're, They don't have that kind of reverence for his character, which probably is only there because of how well Anthony Hopkins did in Silence of the Lambs. But yeah, just that's my take on it is that that's the difference. And that's one of the things I won't go too deep into this because it's not really what we're talking about just yet. But that's one of the main things I like about Red Dragon more in Red Dragon. They give you so much more of Dollar Hyde falling in love with Reba. I, I really like what they have in Manhunter, what's there, but it's really short. I mean, he on his very first time meeting her in that movie, he takes her to like the freaking zoo or something like right away yeah. to, the, to the tiger scene. It's like so truncated and so fast. It's kind of like what's wrong with every single mo like movie adaptation that doesn't do a good job of adapting the book. They just kind of rush through the important stuff. Whereas in man, I mean, sorry, in red dragon, you get so much emotion out of uh, Ray Fiennes and Emily Watson, both of them. They are like fantastic. They got this like weird chemistry in that movie that works. And it pays off because you get this whole thing where just as the characters are starting to get closer and closer and closer to each other, the guy's about to do his third big murder of like a whole family kind of thing. He's getting closer to the moon, uh, the, the, the lunar cycle that he uses to kill with and whatever. And he suddenly is falling in love for the first time with a real woman. I mean, I'm assuming he's never had a girlfriend before with how freaky this dude is. And yeah, he's falling in love and he wants to stop. And it's crazy. Cause will as the guy who should know him better than anybody else, 
said at the beginning that that's almost an impossibility. It'll never happen. And yet it did. It's like a miracle, basically. He starts falling in love and he takes steps to try and never you let the red dragon out again. He wants to stop. And that's amazing. Like, and unfortunately it doesn't all work out <laughs> because yeah. the movie has to keep going, but that's a great part of the story. That's completely absent in Manhunter. Like in Manhunter, the guy literally takes her to his house just to be another victim at the end. Like there's almost no inkling that he cares for her in the same ways that that they they do in the store that the or the way that the story should be you know they it just he takes her there and he kind of starts doing creepy stuff like turning the radio up really loud and kind of like letting her freak out for a bit before he's going to kill her and stuff like there's no the indication that he's emotionally going through this evolution as a character and then the ending as you said is totally different yeah no, it, and it, that, that's true yeah um, oh, I was going to say about that ending, um, it, it's also a bit, it's really over the top uh, in Manhunter. It, it really <laughs> almost makes no sense. But but I guess he's supposed to be demented. Like he's supposed to just completely be out of his wits. Like he doesn't know what he's doing. He's compulsive in those moments. And he... Um, Are you re are you referring to Graham or Dollar Hyde? And uh, oh, to, as, no, I mean to, to Graham jumping through the glass. Like, what was that? Like, why does he smash into the glass? That would not, hurt not so much. The, <laughs> not, <laughs> why not come through the front door? It's like, I, I just don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's so over the top. It, it's the worst way to jump into where a serial killer is because you're you're at a disadvantage. You're gonna be hurt. Why not you might... shoot first? Also, I why don't you glass. just put a bullet just... through the glass? <laughs> <laughs> it's so over the top. Like it's so it almost kills the movie for me there. It's like this is so unnecessary. But I guess and yeah. that's a big thing we can work our way back from is that <laughs> uh yes, in Manhunter, it's all about him. It's called Manhunter. He hunts men. And um it's got this whole psychology thing that Lecter, the way he found Lecter is that there's a mini Lecter in his head, and this is how he discovers people, which, by the way, both movies don't actually illustrate it very, in a sophisticated way. I've seen movies or read stories where you really like see that implemented well, or the person becomes the, the villain in order to understand them and think like yeah. them. I, I don't feel like this is really... Um, does it it doesn't a little bit with red dragon in the end when he uses the psychology yeah. to trick him to to get him to leave the kid but generally uh it's both movies uh intend to have this there where they they think like the villains but but it doesn't really and that's why manhunter goes so far but i, I think they just never earn it for it to go that crazy <laughs> that's <laughs> it needs to be like just slightly less crazy like he still needed to go in. He needed to like put himself in danger, but not stupidly so. Yeah. This is one more thing I liked better in Red Dragon is that the the opening scene and the 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 scrapbook scenes that they show really show that there's like this thing where Dollar Hyde just loves and idolizes uh Lecter. And I felt like when I was watching Manhunter again, I was like they they just suddenly jump to this scene where like oh by the way we, we uh, he he sends him this thing of toilet paper we found it in his cell we got to hurry up and do this thing I was like wh where was the indication in this movie at all that that um, Tom Noonan uh, Dollarhide actually even knew anything about Lecter or cared about him other than the fact that he was like a celebrity serial killer type thing you know like that, it just comes out of nowhere in Manhunter but anyway. Um, what I was trying to say is, uh, I guess the story is supposed to go that Dollar Hyde is obsessed with with uh, Hannibal Lecter. He sends him a secret thing in the mail with um, with uh, the toilet paper message, basically, and they can't read his mail because it's against the law. So he um, he opens it up, he reads it, and then on the section that he destroys was a plan was like a a, a directions for Lecter to respond in the personal ads of the Tadler magazine. And so from that point on, after the toilet paper message, they were corresponding using personal ads. 
and even even that, like the, the toilet paper. In Manhunter, they bring the specialist from a different place just because he's going to do it so much better. There's so much attention to detail about the way, like, Will Graham is such a, a fanatic in that movie. No, it's... It, 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 fingerprint them they fingerprint them no bring the guy that we know that's the best fingerprinter in the world and he's gonna find the fingerprint I, I did like that they they actually in in manhunter after he says that it kind of pays off because it it shows the fingerprint specialist and he's like i got it for you whatever there's like that little brief scene you feel like it all paid off and uh they still have that same thing in in red dragon but they don't do it nearly the same way he just kind of says oh have them check the corneas have them check this have them check that and it, it's not consistent they don't they didn't bring in the specialist i guess yes no and, and maybe that could lead into the discussion about just the the lead character because i do think edward norton and they both did the whole slightly demented thing of talking yeah. while talking to themselves uh, and about and edward norton did it better than uh william peterson i, I was just gonna say that i <laughs> You're talking about like when they walk through the crime scene. Yeah, and they're like, "Oh, you sick bastard! So, That's what you did. That's what you did." Right? <laughs> you took the glove off, didn't you? <laughs> uh, I I feel like if, if you were to like talk about, well, I don't know. There's plenty of movies we could talk about, but like, I I don't know, like the Silence of the Lambs. What's the core thing in that movie? Like, what's the, what are you showing up for? It's the scenes between Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins doing their little. I mean, it's it's like. You can, that's, that's become like a thing. When you talk about other movies, you say, oh, it's like a Hannibal Lecter experience. You know, like, like in, in the, le the last James Bond movie, you know, when they got the bad guy in, in prison, you know, it's like, it's become a thing. You know, it's like, that's, that's what you're there to see. With this movie, I think you're there to see, like the, the core thing that you're there to see is uh, Will Graham walking through these, these CSI scenes and, and talking to himself and basically putting himself in the air quotes in the mind of the, serial killer and I, I think that that ed norton does it a little bit better even though i i love will peterson's um performance i i really do i just i something about the the his i don't know i don't know what it is i can't put my finger on it i just thought ed norton did it a little better he 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 just contained it more pretty much like he didn't go too far with it but but at the same time it was too contained but uh, but that's i guess the big differences between the characters that apparently edward norton internalizes what he went through psychologically to get lecter and putting himself in danger there in the beginning and all that but he doesn't show it too much it actually doesn't seem to hinder him very much maybe slight bad judgment here or there but he's basically with it the manhunter version is just a lunatic <laughs> like he's yeah. he's really does not have things under control he's yeah. a man obsessed and and that's why he goes through the glass and not and doesn't wait <laughs> to like go with the swat in, team. in manhunter um after the family is threatened there uh they they put a scene in that i really liked with graham talking to his son they're, they're in the grocery store and he's kind of talking to yeah. him and he, he's got to explain to him that like look you were too young when this hannibal lecter thing happened and i got hurt but you got to know that like after this happened i had to get therapy yeah. and i i really like that scene it's kind of killed for me because in the scene there's so much product placement on the, the, the aisles behind them that are clearly in focus. <laughs> and then the two characters stop moving the cart. And as their conversation plays out, the product placement behind them changes three times so, <laughs> without them moving. <laughs> so it's a little frustrating, but... <laughs> Not to digress too much, but my memory might be failing me uh, I, I just want to throw this out there, though. Upon rewatching Manhunter, I don't actually recall any moment in Manhunter in which they actually referred to Hannibal as a cannibal. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. I, I, I don't think that Manhunter ever even brought up that Hannibal Lecter was eating his victims. Huh. 
Yeah, do they even, they mention, do they call him Hannibal Lecter or do they just call him? Uh, well, they Lecter? call him Hannibal Lecter, but they, you know. Uh, they, they spelled it differently. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, they spelled it with a K uh, in, in Manhunter and it's a, a C in the, the well, novel. While uh, we're talking right. about it and comparing them, I just want to say that I think Brian Cox is amazing. Like I love Brian Cox in yeah. general and in this movie. It's a yeah. it's a good performance. Yes, yeah. it, it's um, just that Anthony Hopkins just took it one step further. Exactly. But, but and I, I I was gonna say that like if there's two scenes in Manhunter that I think really do it better. Well, for one, there's a scene that's not even in Red Dragon, which is the the scene with the jogger right after they do the Tadlers thing thing where they they kind of put out the fake article. They're they're like baiting. Uh, the red dragon character to come uh-huh. kill him. There's that scene with the jogger and they're like Graham's walking through an empty parking lot. I really like that scene, even though it's a little long. Other than that though, uh, I, oh, and I thought it was funny because it's like so eighties and it's got so much slow-mo in it in the scene. And then right afterward, the, the black guy makes a joke. The, the, uh, basically that there's a character in the scene that is not actually, a serial killer they thought he was so they tackle him and they get their guns out and they they don't end up killing him as they realize he's not like a you know a, a criminal or something i think he's like handcuffed or something and he's like as they're walking away he go, like will graham says let him go or something like that and the guy looks at the at the cops and goes what are you moving in slow motion and i thought that was really funny <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway, I like that scene a lot, and that's not even in Red Dragon, so that's definitely one really nice thing for Manhunter. But the scene where I think Brian Cox shines more than any other is when he's doing the phone scene, where he calls the FBI field office or something like that in order to trick someone, like a secretary, into giving him Will Will Graham's home address. He is so incredible in that scene and so... You you see, because we're looking at his face, we see that his voice is saying one thing and his face is is not genuinely saying it, you know, and it's just, it all plays out so beautifully. And if I had to guess, I would even say that Anthony Hopkins probably looked at that scene a lot before creating his version of, of Hannibal Lecter. And even though I do think Anthony Hopkins is... Hannibal Lecter, like Matt said, he's he lives and breathes that. He's like perfect. But I, I just love Brian Cox, even though I don't think he's quite as good. That one scene, he just like shines. Yeah, he's he's um charming. That's what Lecter is supposed to be. Is supposed to be able to switch that on yeah. and be this manipulative. Anthony Hopkins plays it a, a bit demented. Like he he doesn't sweeten himself up enough, but he still gets what he wants. Yeah, it's just a different way. But 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 yes, the 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 shift the shift from um, and in general, I feel like Brian Cox never plays him too demented. So maybe that's what it is. It just fits better. I, I think but, some but yes. of it's just the uh, the directing and the editing though too, because like like I said before, I mean it, compare the first scene where we get to see Lecter. There's that great moment where Brian Cox is like laying down in this creepy, creepy way. But after that, which is awesome, they, they have their, their exchange, right? Where he's asking him to look at the case file and he doesn't want, well, he does want to, but he wants to try and get as much out of it as he can. And they're kind of dueling back and forth verbally sparring. And it surprised me because I know the scene so well in my head and I was watching it again on a manhunter and um brian cox and will uh william peterson they're like the it's the same words they're probably straight out of the book i bet and it's fast like they're just kind of bouncing the lines back and forth back and forth but in in red dragon there's like this like slow i I don't know like i i just feel like they they had more of a reverence for all the lecture scenes in in that one there's that whole thing where he kind of co- approaches Anthony Hopkins approaches the glass and he gets right up to Ed Norton and he kind of when he challenges him and says like I think you you'd want to just see if you're smarter than this guy and he says something like that implies that you think you're smarter than me and they kind of go back and forth 
there's like this pregnant pause before Ed Norton just says like, you had disadvantages. And he's just like, such as, and he's just like, well, you're insane. You know, and he's like, it just plays out so much more dramatically in Red Dragon than it does in, in Manhunter. And I, I think that might have, you know, that might play into why, even though Brian Cox is amazing, maybe it just didn't, maybe in if they had been planning to make that character a bigger thing and it wasn't all focused on Graham, maybe he would have, you know, slowed those scenes down a little or something. I don't know. It's actually kind of funny to, to, think about that you know like michael mann uh, and i want to preface any of my statements by saying that i think that michael mann is one of the greatest filmmakers that yeah that we have I, I, work I, with him uh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely, and i still want to work with you yeah please please but, but i mean if if he does have a flaw it's that he's too clinical like i i mean he is incredibly clinical methodical fact-based information driven i i mean like you know there are stories about uh when he was making uh ali you know apparently he was actually switching out extras in the crowd for the boxing scenes to match photographs of some of the muhammad ali photographs of those fights. Like he was actually, he was actually swapping out extras to look like the photographs. Like this guy is clinical. This guy is, uh, is methodical to, uh, sometimes to a fault. I mean, there, there are certain movies like heat, which is a masterpiece. And then there are movies like Manhunter, where maybe his, methodical nature crept into the filmmaking and scenes like the one that you're talking about where you get a guy like Brett Ratner who probably doesn't think anything through <laughs> you know just lets uh, just lets the actors play and you get something brilliant out out of your actors and you get something uh emotionally poignant out of that that yeah. might be something Michael Mann, you know, just getting into Michael Mann's brain. He's just methodical. He is just clinical. He is just clean room. Get the information to people. That that that's just my my impression. I could be wrong. So uh, yeah, <laughs> I think we didn't we go for a a talk with him. It was like yes, last for, uh, uh, weekend, we, we all saw all three of us went and saw um, last the Mohicans at the Egyptian. Yeah, no, he's definitely when you listen to him speak, he's you just say like, oh, wow, this guy's on a different level, like the, yeah, the level of <laughs> the level of like thought that he put into things and research. And uh, it almost sounds like Kubrick level type I of uh, believe obsession. That it was how, how many years had it been roughly since silence? Or I'm sorry, since uh, Last of the Mohicans when we saw that probably at least 15 years or something. Well, Last of the Mohicans was, uh, what, er, yeah, early 90s. 90s. Let's just say early 90s. And w when did we see it? We were all living together probably, right? It was like 20. Yeah, uh, yeah Last, of, Last of the Mohicans was 1992. Okay. So yeah, was, no, no. We, we were approaching 20 years since yeah. he had made that movie. They asked him some question, and I just remember he spoke for like 30 minutes about the history of – the Native Americans in the New York area at the time that doesn't actually get talked about in schools that much. And I was like, what? And, and also I was very interested in what he was saying, but I was just like, you learned all of this to make this movie and it's still in your head? Like, it's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. And then meanwhile, uh, Brett Ratner is a traffic cop. <laughs> <laughs> but but somehow that movie really works um but it really does you know what it is but i think it's a good screenplay it, it's it is a bit by the numbers 
and maybe the it's book a really is good screenplay. Yeah, but it's it's really well written. The way the characters are set up and the fact that they focus on the villain more and in, in a way, and and it's a lot of it is way more psychological than visual. The personality of of the lead we mentioned is a bit more toned down, but it's all internal. And then definitely uh, Ray Fiennes, I feel like. His journey, yeah, he's a good-looking guy. That's that's not his issue. His issue is way deeper than what it shows in Manhunter. Yeah. Like it's uh, psychological abuse when he was a kid and all this stuff. So where regardless of your looks, you still feel ugly. Whereas in Manhunter, they just went for the easiest. Well, he he kind of looks like he's not very attractive and he's awkward. A, basically like an incel type of thing where yeah. and and um and ray ray finds it's the complete opposite and that's why edward norton says in the end that he he almost feels bad for him right before he shows up to try to kill his family he's a lot more relatable even though you still relate in manhunter to yeah you do yeah you do relate and you kind of get him and why he feels abandoned, especially once she, in Manhunter, she does cheat on him more so. She's kind of slutty more, like she she kisses the other guy, whereas yeah. I, I don't think the same thing happens in uh, Not really. in Red Dragon. It's mostly like she he's telling her goodbye before going on vacation, but but it's not as if they have a romance. No, um, I you relate to both, but. Yeah, it's, it's different approaches. It's it's interesting the differences and and why those decisions are made. But I guess we solved it. We said Manhunter. It's all about the lead. We're in the yeah. in Red Dragon. It's it's more about at least equal, if not more, about the villains in a way. I I just for me the the you know you guys were saying you guys feel they're about the same, and I was the only one saying I thought Red Dragon was a little better. I mean, for me, like a, the cast is a really big part of it. Like I said before, I think Ed Norton it, uh, does a little bit better job in those clutch scenes that I think are really, really big for this movie. It, it's hard to even say this because I think I think Manhunter has a stellar cast. You know, uh, Will Will Peterson is probably an underrated actor. I would say I love Brian Cox, as I've already said. Tom Noonan's outstanding in this movie. He's just so creepy. Joan Allen's always great. Dennis Farina, he's great too. But if if I have to really like say, I mean, I think Ed Norton was better. I think Anthony Hopkins manages to somehow be better. I think Ray Fiennes is better. I think Emily Watson is better. And even little roles like that that nasty Freddie Lowndes guy, um, you know, that Philip Seymour Hoffman. That scene where he's like glued to the chair, I feel that so much more. I feel like the other guy, I, I wrote his name down somewhere. I don't know what his, what his name is. Uh, Stephen Lang. He's You're not Stephen Lang. <laughs> okay. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> like, he's playing a, a very by the number swarmy like character. He's he's just he's kind of like got that that you know he's that kind of. Uh, guy he's gonna get the story no matter what he's like a paparazzi type guy or whatever and it's fine you know it's fine but it's like when you see the look on philip seymour hoffman's face when when ray finds like drops that robe and he just like reveals his naked tattooed body like i mean he looks terrified like he he just i i feel bad for him even though he's like scum of the earth like he's just he's outstanding and um, the guy who plays Dr. Chilton in Manhunter is also very competent. And it's, he's very good in the couple of scenes that he's in. But that um, that Anthony Heald, however you say his name, I mean, it probably helps that he was so well done in Silence of the Lambs. And then he just basically has to play the same character in this one. But, mm -hmm. um, I mean, he's he's really good as Dr. Chilton. Yeah, he's uh, sort of like the demented, um, overseeing the demented. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like he's, and he's he's so um, cheap, you know. <laughs> he's, he's I would you know you'd hate to know that person. <laughs> yeah, I will say Harvey Keitel was kind of dry for me. I almost yeah. preferred Dennis Farina's, um, even though just the, the funny thing is just his face 
and his history yes. elevates the role. Of, so but, it's so crazy you said that, Gil, because I he's the I love Harvey Keitel. I really love him, but he I don't know. I don't like him that much. Well, Dennis Freeman is better. And if I'm going to, you know, this is the one character actually in that we have three different actors for actually is is uh, Crawford, Jack Crawford. I think Scott Glenn is the best out of the three of them in terms oh, easily. of yeah. just, just in terms of Jack Crawford. But, uh, and then I would, I would actually put Farina second. I think he was a little better than Harvey Keitel. That's in yeah. Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Uh, Scott Glenn plays Jack Crawford in Silence of the Lambs. He has a whole bunch of scenes with Jodie Foster. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I am going out on a limb, but, because I do love Ray Fiennes, but I I do think that Tom Noonan was a better Francis Dollar Hyde. What? I, I yeah, I I I'm saying it and I'm sticking by it. <laughs> it, it, it. It was just it was a good performance, and I I um no I, I love him, especially a, a a big fan of his from uh, Last Action Hero. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't he also in? He's in in Heat, isn't he? Uh, yeah, he's the guy in the wheelchair who right. uh, gives, uh, yes. yeah, yeah, who gives. He had the uh, line about the uh, early internet, and he's like, "It's all out there, floating around." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have... He, oh, yeah, he, I know. He's got like a mustache or something, doesn't he? Not in here. Why, why does but... he look so different? In I guess because he doesn't have the hair lip or something. I don't know. Also, uh, RoboCop Two. It's a good performance. Oh, like, great like performance in. Ro- <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> oh, he's. I love Tom Noonan. Yeah, I know, but uh, but yeah, I know he's more immediately relatable because of his, you know, he's like bald, he's tall he, in an awkward sort of way, not in a good looking sort of way. It's definitely the more easily relatable, but the Ray Fiennes thing is you sort of have to go under the surface. That's the only time where I feel like Red Dragon goes deeper, at least as far as um you know, being smart about the way they approach something. Otherwise, a lot of the decisions feel very generic, like very obvious choices. Also, I feel like the relationship, it really helps me that they set up the relationship with the wife. For example, like Mary Louise Parker, who's always good. um, She's kind of a nothing character. Like, she, yeah, she shoots him in the end. He teaches her. But They do better in Manhunter, huh? Yeah, they they establish her as she and she doesn't say much in Manhunter, but she's sexy. <laughs> she's like a sexual object, but in in a sort of like strong sort of way. Like I got your back. I don't like you going back and doing this, but you know I can be with I love the kids. That scene because I I didn't even remember it until rewatching it, but I love that he's asking her permission, and she she says to him, "You've already made up your mind." Yeah. Yeah, no, that relationship, that's the one thing that's definitely handled better in Manhunter. Yeah, There's sure. a little bit of that in uh, Red Dragon, but yeah. but it's not as strong, and it's too bad, because it could have easily been. Uh, that could have been just a mild direction issue. But yeah, it also, I think... a time thing, too. Maybe they just I, decided to skip it, because they were putting so much time into the other stuff. Yeah, and I think the father-son relationship also was stronger in Manhunter. But it that's... Was. It was yeah. like that scene I talked about with the product placement. Yeah. No. And then also yeah. on the beach, they do the whole thing. They build the, the, the net oh, yeah. for the thing, which comes back in the end, you know, when really? they we go back. The... Wait, what, what comes back in the end? I like they, they build a net for, I don't know if it's the turtles or something that come out of the water or something. And they're going to, Oh, oh okay. Yeah. And then they yeah. come back to it in the end. It's like when they come back to the same house. Anyways, it's all, it's interesting the way they approach it. And obviously Whatever the movie's trying to do, I don't think Red Dragon made a mistake by focusing more on other things and not this. Uh, visually, too, the one thing is just the scenes with Lecter being so white and bright and Manhunter of all things. Everything is so dramatic in Manhunter, but then the lighting in those scenes is like a hospital. But then you go to... Um, Red Dragon, and they do the whole Silence of the Lambs, where it's extreme. It's like a dungeon. Yeah. And there's the only white is like his clothing, and everything else is like dark around him. Yeah. So it's uh, very different approaches visually. Strange, actually, but but maybe that's the idea. Is like it's supposed to be like all white, sort of 
it's like a Japanese thing. Like it's, it's symbolizing death or something. <laughs> I mean, they, it, it's, it's kind of getting into Michael Mann's whole clinical streak to, you know, yeah, I, like I he, he to, wanted um, Lecter to be clean or something like yeah. that. Yeah. We were talking all about all these guys about, you know, which one was, was it we preferred in one movie over another and so on and so forth. And, and I was, we talked about Jack Crawford being played by three different people in three different movies. So if you look at all four of these movies, like the two that are, that we're talking about now, which are, you know, a remake of each other or whatever you want to call it. And then the other two um, adaptations of the other books that came after silence of the lambs and Hannibal. It's interesting that you've got characters like, or actors like uh, Anthony Heald playing Dr. Chilton in two of them. You've got uh, mm-hmm. Anthony Hopkins playing him. Uh, I almost said himself. Oh, that's sad. Uh, <laughs> playing <laughs> Hannibal <laughs> in uh, in three of them. Uh, but it's. I found it very interesting. As soon as I saw this in Manhunter, I almost jumped out of my seat to grab my computer and double check that I wasn't going crazy. But the nurse orderly character Barney, the big tall black guy. He yeah. is the same actor in Red Dragon and he, as he is in Silence of the Lambs. And he plays, he has one scene in Hannibal at the very beginning when he sells the Hannibal Lecter mask to Gary Oldman. He's playing the same character in all three movies. But what's yeah, interesting that's... is he's also one of the police, like SWAT team lieutenants in Manhunter. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, he's the only right? car- the only actor who's in all four movies. <laughs> yeah, Frankie Faison. Yes, Frankie Faison. Yeah, yeah, that is kind of interesting. <laughs> Man, and he's in his seventies now. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, these movies are twenty something years old. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, good on a, Yeah, it's a good example of uh, for sure. Of uh, like watching these of just the uh, different approaches. Like one is extremely visual. One is almost feels like a like a very good TV show, <laughs> borderline not a movie. Like the performances is what elevates it really, but not the visuals. Yeah, that's 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 one thing I would say. One last thing is like, there's some really elaborate wonders and shots that Michael Mann does in in Manhunter that just I think there's one. That's in Red Dragon. I think it might be in the house, the uh, dollar hide. So, um, I think so. But but the, other than that, it's really a lot of it is just coverage, 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 coverage. Whereas Manhunter is is a lot of two shots and and mixing movement into it and just a lot more dramatic. So it's uh it it goes to show th- these are very good examples. Like somebody would watch Red Dragon is like man, it's a good movie. And it's got some good visuals, but then you see Manhunter's like, oh wow. <laughs> like, <laughs> I guess Red Dragon wasn't as cinematic as I thought. And maybe Man- Manhunter was too cinematic, but but it gives you an idea. I think for film students to see this. Yeah. You mm-hmm. totally see what's the, what is the difference with yeah. filmmakers. Uh, it could do the same thing with like a Spielberg movie. Watch any Spielberg <laughs> movie after any other movie in the world, pretty much. It was like, oh <laughs> shit, like this guy moves the camera like like he's connected to it with some sort of like <laughs> cosmic uh, uh, powers. <laughs> it's just it's so it's so different. Since you brought it up, I was just gonna say I I, I think Dollar Hyde's house is also one of the things that to me is like a strength in the red dragon movie because the house tells helps tell the story of why he's so screwed up and and his origin with his abusive mother or grandmother or whatever the heck she was the the woman who raised him and it's it's only because the only person he brought to his house was blind <laughs> that he gets away with not being outed as a psychopath or whatever for living in this creepy crazy old house whereas in, in manhunter it's just like super 80s and and i mean you know yeah, you could walk like through that house and you'd house. be like well this just looks like the house of a guy who's like a kind of a a little obsessive about certain things here and there but i mean you wouldn't think he was crazy yeah it's a good looking house <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, no, and he lives like on the lake, and she gets out when, like, the morning after, and like the sun is rising, and he walks out. It's like a perfect shot of the sunrise. Yeah. <laughs> like, what the hell is this? Like, are they gonna like make out now? Um, I actually well, really love that you're talking about in Manhunter, right? In Manhunter, like, it's yeah, so I romantic when he gets out because he runs up to her, like you're saying, and. He does something with his posture. Like he's so tall compared to her. And she's a tall woman, but at least I believe she is. But like he walks up to her, he's so tall. And he kind of does this thing where he's standing up straight, but then his head and shoulders kind of hunch down a little bit. And I'm like, oh man, he's messed up. <laughs> We're like all in silhouette. <laughs> yeah. Well, one last thing I would say, which maybe brings it back to um to uh Sounds of the Lambs. Who knows? Maybe someday we'll award it with an episode. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but um, I, I know Sounds of the Lambs has always been cast as this great horror movie, right? Uh, well, and I've never there's a debate about it. I guess it's, yeah. it's a debate, yeah, exactly, because it's not really a horror movie. It's it's more suspense. But because it's um, there's such scary moments in it, like scares, like boo type of stuff. That with Lecter and maybe later on with the um, Buffalo with Bill, Buffalo Bill, but uh, definitely Red Dragon Manhunter are not that. It feels like it's definitely more suspense. It's clear that these are not. Uh, I did find it amusing. It's uh, on IMDb. <laughs> they qualify Red Dragon as crime drama thriller, and then Manhunter is crime mystery thriller. <laughs> so. Huh. So it kind of shows how like Manhunter is just a little bit more mysterious than Red Dragon. And maybe this sums up the differences uh, about this, uh, the way both movies were approached. There's just hmm. Red Dragon is just kind of straightforward. It's a procedural and Manhunter is like, ah, it's in the shadows and you know, all very uh, well, mysterious. I mean, isn't that kind of a relevant difference between the two movies and that, you know, Manhunter came out before Silence of the Lambs and, you know, before Hannibal Lecter became like this household name that everybody just knows Hannibal the Cannibal, Manhunter was kind of more cloaked in mystery, whereas Red Dragon it, it not only came after Silence of the Lambs, it came after Hannibal. Uh, so, like, Red Dragon comes out and you know, they're dealing with a, a, a much more well-known property. <laughs> they, they are dealing with something where, uh, you, you know who this dude is. It just had to be handled entirely differently. <laughs> uh, and in a sense, it's almost like red dragon. We, we had all the pieces. We just needed to hand it to somebody to put it together. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could still be approached within that. Um, of course, of course. Uh, as yeah. more mysterious as far as the, the mystery of who this guy is and and the whole thing with, uh, with Lecter. Like, for example, like, they don't show much about the relationship with Lecter. They don't show the scene in the beginning in Red Dragon and Manhunter where Lecter enters him. But it's, it, it is just interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a different um, approach and... I, actually, that's kind of uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, that that first scene where Hannibal does stab Will Graham at the beginning of Red Dragon, would that have been stronger in Manhunter? Just that's the thing. The well, it, it wouldn't work. That's the, it. Wouldn't work. The yeah, only reason why it Man works is all Dragon. about Graham. Yeah, yes, but also. And Red Dragon, this is actually a good point. It only works in Red Dragon because uh, it's a prequel. Uh, otherwise, like, if you see Lecter for the first time in those scenes, that's not... I mean, Lecter has to show up the way he showed up in Silence of the Lambs. Like, in a cage, mysterious, like, scary. Like, I, you don't want to see him as some sort of person that looks normal and is, you know going to a concert and all that that only works in manhunter there would be very little context it wouldn't make sense it would basically he would be yeah one of his advisors that ends up being the one who tries to kill him but there's no context there like the power of that I would, scene i would not. argue that you're you're absolutely right that um 
we we can kind of love the scene because it's a prequel that came after two previous movies and so on and so forth. But I mean, I bet you if you showed Red Dragon to somebody who had never seen any other one before and didn't really know too much about the story or anything like that, they would just be surprised probably when he shows up with the knife and and whatever. And it would probably just be like a like a twist or something. It probably wouldn't be like this makes no sense at all. Yes, and also you wouldn't get that he kidnapped the uh, and killed the uh, the bad musician and then fed him to the. Uh, well, except that they explain it in the in the 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 um, later on the following um, little uh, newspaper clipping. On this clip. Yes, yes, but but again, it would be a bit of a shock. Yeah, yeah, it's just <laughs> it would be a bit too much. It's like where's that movie? <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. Like, well, it is strange that if if he's so smart, you know, uh, Walt Graham, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that he has no clue. Right. That he doesn't it suspect does come him full at all. Circle in a nice way, though, at the end when he can comfort Emily Watson and tell her like, when she's like, "I should have known," and he's like, "You know what? Sometimes you can't." You know, he's like, "I've been there. Trust me." Yeah, I guess he does. So that that works out. That's uh, touche there. <laughs> yeah, but but still, like there there's that whole thing about this is dialogue that I would attribute not to Brett Ratner because I don't think he's ever written a paragraph in his life. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, like that I would attribute to a Brett Ratner movie. You know, like the whole. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta I'm hear sorry. what you're saying. I, I don't know what you're reading yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, in that scene where you know Will Graham is sitting there and talking to Hannibal, and you know you have that whole spiel where he's like, uh, you know, you're the most brilliant clinical psychologist in the world, and I don't understand how you didn't see this. How can you telegraph that? more than what they had on the screen. I mean, <laughs> especially after we've already seen two fucking movies <laughs> with Hannibal and we know what this guy is. Everybody knows what this guy is. And you've got Will Graham sitting there like, oh, geez, you're just baffling me. You're like, you're, you're this brilliant guy and you should have seen this before I did. <laughs> uh, wh why didn't you see this before I did? I'm just oblivious. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's just it it, it just doesn't work. It, and it it is one of those things where again, you know, for all of Manhunter's flaws, again, I give it points in that Michael Mann didn't have a crutch when making right. Manhunter. Brent Ratner had two crutches. Yeah. I mean he had everything just laid out on a plate for him. And all he needed to do was make a competent movie and it was going to be, it was going to be okay. I mean, oh God, it, three. <laughs> so anyway. uh, Michael Mann actually had to be creative and he made mistakes in Manhunter, but those were his mistakes. And Brett Ratner just, took a script that he didn't write because I'm, I, I doubt that he's even literate. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, uh, <laughs> I assumed I, there was going to be some insulting of Brett Ratner here, but I, <laughs> I feel like noob noob. I'm in the background sweeping the floor. I'm like, God damn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking for myself, not for my friends. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, all he needed to do was was shoot the damn movie. And uh, I, I mean, the, the cast was pretty much already set up for him. The writing was already done for him, and he just needed to point the camera in a direction and get somebody to put it in focus. <laughs> so. No, I mean, it, it is tough to make a movie for sure. So he, he did just... But yes, the fact that it's all lined up for him, it's pretty much what he's good for. And he's said it himself. Like he actually, one of the famous quotes that he has is that I'm the type of movie that 
Hollywood brings in when it's they already have a surefire hit and they just need someone to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know he ever said that. That's funny. Yeah, there was some something where um, I don't know somebody was acting out his quotes. It was like a parody of him, oh, and wow. um, and and yeah, it's like these are actual quotes from Brett Radner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in any case, um, well, I was I was just gonna say since we're saying so much about Brett Ratner here, I wanted to say two things real quickly, just to, in defense of of um, Red Dragon, real quickly, just that um, one thing is that. If you can, if we can just for a brief moment think back to 2002, right? This is right at the beginning of the terrible explosion uh, in Hollywood of maybe I should say instead of explosion, saturation of prequels. Because in '99, Star Wars Episode One made more money than any movie ever should have made. And it did it before it even sold a ticket. You know, it, it's just ridiculous. And everyone suddenly, suddenly prequel was like a household name or household word, I should say. Sorry, phrase. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, before that, how many prequels did you ever see before episode one? I mean, there's like uh, Temple of Doom and what? Maybe two or three, five others ever in existence. And then suddenly that movie made so much money Hollywood just said, oh my gosh, if there was a movie that, that anybody even remotely liked, we got to know what happened before it. And suddenly there's like prequels to everything, stuff that we absolutely did not need at all. And if you look at how many pretty bad ones there are out there, like uh, Red Dragon's pretty good. Yeah. And then the only mm -hmm. other thing I was just going to say is that just, I literally just saw this right now and I can't believe I had forgotten all about this, but. It's crazy to me to think that uh, I don't know if you guys mentioned where you thought it compared, but I said at the beginning, and I still stand by this, that Red Dragon is a better movie than Hannibal. And it's really Scott, you know, and it's got yeah. Gary Oldman in it. And I didn't remember this until right now, but it was written by David Mamet. Yeah. And um, it's still not as good. <laughs> well, that makes my argument that um, Ridley Scott is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> but I love Ridley Scott. Yeah. It, yeah, Steve Zalian. Yeah, it's like good writers. What, what else is Steve Zalian then? I don't know his name. What? I'm just clicking on him now. What else has he done? I don't, I don't oh, know. Oh, he, uh, he wrote a, a few Spielberg films like Schindler's List. Oh, and, my God. Uh, yeah, Schindler's List, Searching for Bobby Fischer. Yes, Bobby Fischer. The, yeah, no, no. The, he's a, he's the, a good writer. He he's a, the, the American girl with the dragon tattoo. Yeah, no, American gangster. Yeah. I, I was actually kind of thinking about this in terms of Red Dragon and Manhunter, but I think it's actually more relevant when it comes to Hannibal. Like just the comparison of like different sports. I mean, a point guard in basketball is just going to be a good point guard in basketball. It doesn't matter if he gets traded from one team to another. I mean, you know, you're just a good point guard in football. You know, we talk about scheme fits, right? You know, like uh, it, it, uh, you could be a great quarterback and a great wide receiver and all that stuff, but if you don't really fit into the system, uh, you're not going to really optimize things. Like you're, you're not going wow. to be performing all that well. To me, Hannibal is a perfect example of getting a bunch of superstars on your team, but they don't fit the scheme. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a, a movie that has great moments and overall yeah. doesn't work, which is probably exactly similar to what you're saying. Yeah, I, I oh, uh, you're good at running zone, but we're running man all the time, so it doesn't really work. Yeah, I mean, Steven Zellian and David Mamet are two of the greatest writers ever, and I can see how they don't mesh as like a team writing a uh, writing a screenplay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean Ridley Scott. I I, I mean I, I like Ridley Scott more than Gil does. Uh, but you know, <laughs> many do, yeah, yeah. Uh, but 
yeah, I mean, I can see how this is just like, you know, you have like an all-star team when it comes to talent, but nobody really kind of fits into the roles correctly. Yeah, and I guess that brings it back to Manhunter and uh, Red Dragon that both have really good casts that for the most part work really well yeah, in, in different ways. <laughs> Very different ways. Yeah.